This video is done in collaboration with Henry the Paleo Guy, ATR1X underscore, Curious Archive, Spino Dude Reviews, and Some Raptor. Check out their channels via links in the description and comment section below. Low poly models in this video were made by Adam Midzuk or Kuzim. They were animated by Cameron, Camzilla94, and by Nyx. Sauropods, or long necks, were the largest things to ever walk the face of the earth. Nothing else has come close. Whether that's because something evolves to curb them before they reach the same size as the long neck dinosaurs, or that the sauropods were just built different, the fact remains that nothing existed before or after them that could compete. The only critters to beat out the land titans are the oceanic leviathans, but that's water, they're cheating. Each new sauropod dinosaur discovered helps to understand the group as a whole, as every single one is fragmentary, with very few considered relatively complete. One of these well-preserved behemoths was yet another South American beast from the late Cretaceous. Come and join me in learning about one of the most complete of the titanosaurs, Dreadnoughtus, the living citadel. Every fossil organism is fragmentary. There is pretty much not a single one that has literally 100% of every bone that was in its body when it died. Kinda gonna happen when bones become fossil over millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions of years. Some animals preserve better than others. That may be due to the environment in which they died and or in which they were buried and fossilized. Other times, this may be due to the type of animal it was. Yet, more differences in fossilization may occur due to the size of the organism. Rainforests are acidic and without stable bodies of water and sediment to bury fossils. Hollow-boned animal skeletons deteriorate faster and easier than solid-boned animals. Larger animals get torn apart and their skeletons scatter to the winds easier than smaller animals. And so, we come to the largest animals to ever live, the sauropod dinosaurs. Those that lived in extremely tropical areas like rainforests left little to no evidence. Though smaller species are less numerous to us, those that have been found are usually more intact than the larger ones. The smaller parts of the body, like the head, are some of the first bits to go. This is unfortunate as the skulls of sauropods are some of the most important parts as they can help place a given specimen into an evolutionary perspective. Lacking a head makes things harder, though not impossible. Sometimes luck strikes and a large sauropod skeleton is found and in great condition. The mother load, or holy grail, so to speak. One such holy grail was found on a fossil prospecting expedition to Argentina in 2004 by a small team that quickly grew as dig seasons went on. Dreadnought for Tis But Discovery Dr. Kenneth Lacovera, professor of paleontology and geology at Rowan University, founding dean of Rowan University's School of Earth and Environment, founding director of the Rowan Fossil Park, and Explorers Club Medal recipient, was surface prospecting on the east bank of the Rio La Leona, which is between Lago Argentino and Lago Viedma, through the Cerro Fortaleza formation of Santa Cruz Province, Patagonia, Argentina, in an expedition back in the summer of 2004. The Cerro Fortaleza Formation, or formally the Pariaike Formation, is a layer of rock dating to the late Cretaceous Epoch. Specifically, it chronicles the Campanian to the Maastrichtian Ages 83 to 66 million years ago. It therefore provides a perfect window of how flora and fauna changed right up until the mass extinction. 
Dr. Lacovera was first to find the bits that would lead to a dig site containing two skeletons of what would end up being one of the most complete titanosaurian sauropod dinosaurs ever found. As Dr. Lacovera said in an interview about this discovery, Our first field season down there was in 2004, and that was a rough field season. We didn't have a road to access the area, so we had to raft down a glacial stream to get to the site. We were about 100 miles off the power grids and couldn't carry many supplies out there, so our rations were meagre. We began to find remains of giant dinosaur bones, but they were all fragmentary, and they were, for the most part, preserved with iron minerals. Most of the fragments we found that year were at the top of a mountain. I attempted to get a helicopter from the Argentinian Air Force to extract these bones, and they actually said yes, but the deal fell through at the 11th hour. So, I had to find and hire two teams of guachos with their horses, and we built metal sleds and wooden toboggans to extract that material. The first field season anywhere, there's a lot of pressure to make some discovery in order to justify the projects and return trips. We found enough material that first year to justify a return trip, on the first day of the 2005 expedition, while prospecting for fossils, I spotted a small patch of bones and recorded the location with GPS. We returned a few hours later and began excavating. By the end of the day, we'd exposed about 10 bones of what we would eventually call Trisnortus screnae. Four expeditions later, we had collected 145 bones of this new giant's dinosaur. Initially, when Dr. Lacovera went down to Patagonia, he had gone with volunteers from the University of Patagonia as he had some technicians from the laboratory at the University of Patagonia, which was about a thousand miles away from the field site. When he went back the next year, he took a Drexel graduate student. As Dr. Lacovera continues, The year after that, I took more graduate students and for the first time, a Drexel undergraduate, Alison Moyer, who was a sophomore biology major at the time. I had great trepidation about bringing an undergraduate to such remote field sites. We got down there, and Alison informed me that she had never been camping before, which was probably a question I should have asked earlier. She did great that field season, so much so that I brought her back the next year. She became a leader among the team. In fact, at one point she had kind of gone feral on me, and I worried about whether she would reassimilate into polite Philadelphia society when we got home. Now she's graduated and she's at North Carolina State University working on a PhD in molecular paleontology. And she will be in the vanguard of the first fully trained researchers in this new field of science, so I'm very proud of her. Dr. Lacovera was able to take two Patagonian undergrad students who had previously volunteered on the sauropod dig site project to the doctorate program at Drexel University where Dr. Lacovera had been teaching at the time. Both of the undergrad students then went back to Argentina and are now taking the lead in science in their country through the Argentinian version of the National Science Foundation, the CONACET. When you find a bone in the field, you begin to excavate the rock around that bone. It's very difficult in this size because the rock is like concrete, so we're using hammers and chisels and pickaxes all day. But you try to leave some rock on the bone because the rock has stabilised that bone for millions and millions of years. You want to continue to do that while you transport the bone. And so, we leave a veneer of rock around the bone, and we chop down until we pedestal a bone. And then, we begin to tunnel underneath of it, and we wrap bandages of burlap and plaster around the bone. For big bones like femur, we'll jack it some steel bars into it. Then, eventually, we have encased it in this past cocoon that protects it during transport. Says Dr. Lacovera. How did they get those fossils home? There were so many, and they added up to well over 16 tons. Well, they couldn't be flown, so they were floated there via ocean freighter. When we get it here, we have to open those jackets, much like a physician would open up the cast on a broken arm. And then, we have to very carefully remove the rock that is attached to the bone. Sometimes we can do that with dental tools. Sometimes we have to use these mini jackhammers called air scribes. It's very painstaking work. The bones expand when you take the rock off them, and so you get expansion cracks that form. We use specialized adhesive for paleontology to stabilize those cracks, to infill those cracks, and to make the fossil stable so that it will last for centuries in a museum. All the products that we use are easily reversible with ace time, so that if a paleontologist 200 years from now doesn't like how we did the work, they can reverse it and do it again in the way that they see is best. We also try to make the bones very transparent to future paleontologists. We don't camouflage the pussy, or try to paint the pussy to match the bones. We want them to know what's the original material, and what is the work that we've done. Uh, did you forget something? So, how did they get to take these whole sauropods home? 
most countries in the world have laws that govern their fossil resources. In Argentina, it doesn't matter where a fossil is, it doesn't matter who finds it. When you break the surface on that fossil, it immediately becomes property of the federal government of Argentina, which is fine, and that's how it should be. So, over a long period of negotiation, I was able to arrange an exportation of the fossils for research to Drexel University over a four-year period. The initial loan period was extended in 2013, so this resulted in a lot of great collaboration and cooperation with scientists in Argentina, with the National Museum in Argentina, the Provincial Museum in Santa Cruz province. Soon, we will be creating all these bones and sending them back to their home in southern Patagonia. As you can see in this video, the students, volunteers, and scientists at Drexel University took several weeks to create custom crates to contain 16 tons of fossils. A little over three months after the publication and unveiling of Dreadnoughtus, the students had to say goodbye so the specimens could return home to where they belong. They eventually made their way to the Museo Padre Molina in Rio Gallegos, Argentina, where they remain to this day. I have seen a few photos of the central exhibit space at the Museo Padre Molina, and you can see a display box with Dreadnoughtus fossils in it. It's unclear if those fossils are casts or original specimens. I sort of hope they're casts since they lack a top or railing to reduce potential damage from visitors. Dreadnoughtus merch is now available on the Edge Redbubble. Links in the description and comment section below. Over the four summers it took to remove the fossils from the dig site, two specimens were found, one larger than the other. The larger, more complete, and holotype specimen, MPM PV1156, consists of a chunk of the face and a tooth, two bits of neck vertebrae, a handful of neck ribs, most of the back vertebrae, almost the entire tail, a majority of the dorsal ribs, the left shoulder blade, and left forelimb, except for the hand. It also has both sternal plates, these guys here from the chest, and the entire pelvis. Lastly, the holotype also contained the entire left hind limb, except for chunks of the foot, and the lower half of the right hind limb with a few feet bits. The second specimen, the paratype specimen, MPM PV 3546, a partially articulated postcranial skeleton of a slightly smaller noodle neck. This specimen contains a partial neck vertebra, multiple back vertebrae, and ribs, the top part of the pelvis, seven tail vertebrae, and five tail ribs, all pelvic elements, and the left femur. Sounds pretty damn good. But how good? How complete is this dinosaur? On a total completeness, the animal was 45.5% complete. If you mirror the bones from one side that are missing on the other, then it is technically 70.4%, the other percentage being bones that are completely missing from both sides of the body. The research team who described the remains, a team of 17 researchers led by Dr. Kenneth Lacovera, decided to name the animal Dreadnoughtus shrani. Dreadnoughtus is technically Old English for fearing nothing, but obviously has more commonly been shortened to Dreadnought and used for a bunch of ships, specifically the battleships of the early 20th century. Meanwhile, the species name, Shrani, honors the American entrepreneur, Adam Shran, for his support of the research. Due to the somewhat groundbreaking nature of these specimens, plenty of research has been published on them since they were first described. I will eventually go through everything that has been said on these dinosaurs, but we must first start with how the OG team described them. The discovery of Dreadnoughtus helps to provide more insight into the general anatomy of this group of titanosaurs, especially when it comes to the limbs, shoulder blades, and pelvis. The vast majority of the bones from both Dreadnoughtus specimens are extremely well preserved. They were only minimally deformed from the fossilization process, with the hind limb bones being especially three-dimensional. An odd characteristic of the animal was its long neck. Despite fragmentary nature of the neck region, a rough estimate of its overall size can be met, 
thanks to comparisons with other sauropods as well as the types of bones from the neck that were found, one from the end and one from the middle. This gives a good idea of how long the neck would be since the number of neck bones in these types of titanosaurs doesn't change horrifically from one to the other. As such, the neck was rather long for these animals, with a super rough estimate of about 11.3 meters 37 feet. Based on proportions of its bones and comparisons to the proportions of other known sauropods, it may have been able to stretch its neck up two stories. If the missing pieces of the neck and tail are filled in based on known elements from other sauropod dinosaurs, the animal was pretty similar to other titanosaurian sauropods. Dreadnoughtus was a total beefcake. It had a shoulder blade that measured 1.74 meters in length, making it longer than any other known titanosaur. The ilium, the bull-shaped top part of the pelvis here, is also too damn big. The ilium is the largest known from a titanosaur, measuring 1.31 meters. A funny thing about Dreadnoughtus is that it technically had the tallest forelimbs of any known titanosaur. It is only surpassed, and only slightly, by the mahusive forearms of Brachiosaurus for which it got its name. It did not skip arm day. The reason Dreadnoughtus' massive arms don't look so massive is because its hind limbs were about equal in length, so proportionally it wasn't long-armed, but just a really tall-legged titanosaur. It was smart and worked arms and legs, take note kings. Sauropods can be mechanically divided into narrow and wide-gauged varieties. By this, I mean that the placement of the limbs and feet in association with the hip bones was either narrow or wide. The narrow-gauged sauropods were critters like the diplodocids. Over time, wider and wider-gauged hipped sauropods developed, mostly the titanosaurs. The ball joint of the femur was damn near a 90 degree angle in some of the latest titanosaurs thick in ass. In the case of Dreadnoughtus, though it was undoubtedly wide gauged as well, it had a narrower stance than the armored saltosaurid titanosaurs. Dreadnoughtus was also chadly in how barrel chested it was. Its broad sternal bones created a wide pectoral girdle, which, when combined with the amount of muscle in this area, would have made the animal quite busty. They got that Chris Evans chest going on. Controversy over the mass weight. The team that first described the remains used a weight equation from a 2012 paper by Campion and Evans. This equation, equation 1, lets you estimate the body mass of a quadrupedal animal using only the circumference of the humerus and the femur. This is, on its face, especially useful for fossil specimens that only preserve their humerus and femur. With this equation, the research team got a mass of 59 tons. Sauropod paleontologist Dr. Matt Waddell quickly got around to a rebuttal towards this estimation a few days after the paper was published on the blog Sauropod Vertebra Picture of the Week, which he co-runs with Drs. Darren Nash and Mike Taylor. Dr. Waddell states that this value is presumably a middle-of-the-road estimate that the equation provided. This is because a 95% confidence interval would mean that the animal could have been anywhere between 40 and 80 tons, or perhaps an even wider range. That's obviously no good. Dr. Waddell then looked to see if the published 59 tons was even plausible for Dreadnoughtus to begin with. He used graphic double integration. This method was originally invented back in the 70s to estimate the volumes of cranial endocasts, which are sediment casts of the brain case. This technique is easy. You cut a 3D organism into slices, compute the average cross-sectional area of each body part, multiply that by the length of the body part in question, and add up the results. This method was originally applied to whole animal bodies in 1999. You also need different perspective views of the animal's body. Top, front, bottom, side. Dr. Waddell used both the profile view skeletal reconstruction provided with the original paper and different views afforded by the 3D scanned skeleton also provided by the original paper. 
Once Dr. Waddell did all the maths and added everything up, he got a dreadnoughtus of 57 cubic meters of volume, so about 57 tons. That isn't far off from the figured 59-ton mass of the paper. Unfortunately, a new problem emerged. This value is assuming that all body parts of Dreadnoughtus were generally round in cross-section, but a lot of sauropods had distinctly non-round body cross-sections. The necks of apatosaurs were damn near rectangular. A lot of titanosaur rib cages bulged out to the sides like crazy, and some sauropods had really tall and flat tails. To assume that Dreadnoughtus had a circular body cross-section may inflate the mass. Another but comes in here. This is assuming sauropods were as dense as water. But based on their bones, they were far less dense. Sauropods were some of the airiest animals to ever walk on land. Sauropod bodies were frickin' weird. I referenced before that some sauropods were wide-gauged and narrow-gauged in their hip structures and how close their limbs were to the midline of their bodies. This distinction carries over to their bodies as well. Some sauropods were just straight-up tacos. Others were corn dogs, yet more were bricks. Let me show you what I mean. Here is a cross-section of a diplodocus. It is a vertebra from the back and accompanying ribs. An important thing to note here is that the ribs of sauropods largely bent down from their connection to the vertebra. As you can see in these ribs from a mammal, the ribs arch up and out before coming down to form the body walls. Here in this comparative diagram of ribs from a Euromastix, monitor lizard, iguana, and croc, reptiles have ribs that stick out of their vertebrae sideways before arching down to form the body walls. This then makes the orientation of the ribs and how they form the body walls quite strange in the sauropods. Diplodocus and its relatives were tacos. Their body walls were tall and thin comparatively. Then you have your hot dogs, usually heftier beasts like the macronarians, brachiosaurs, and camarasaurs. We are hot dogs too, so are cows, and they even become them too. The titanosaurs were just bricks. This is the cross-section of the obnoxiously named Opisthocoelacaudia. Taking our attention back to Dr. Waddell and the Dreadnoughtus bod, a rounded cross-section to the torso is acceptable. Where it becomes less believable, according to Dr. Waddell, is in the neck and tail. Given the benefit of the doubt required for muscles, the tail and neck could not have been entirely circular in cross-section according to every view of the fossils available. Dr. Waddell speculated a width-to-height ratio of at least 2 to 3, so body and limbs circular, neck and tail not circular. Got it. Now what does it all mean? Taking the calculations of volume for the animal with the math that would also take into account the air-filled voids of sauropod bones, plus the circular cross-sections of the body and limbs and non-circular cross-sections of the neck and tail, Dr. Waddell found that a more accurate mass estimate for the larger Dreadnoughtus to be between 35 and 40 tons. Dr. Mike Taylor commented on this article by Dr. Waddell, providing some welcome take-home messages for anyone reading, listening, learning, and trying to understand the science of it all. Dr. Taylor says, what this really tells us is not that either you or Dr. Lacovara and team got this wrong, but that using two different approaches to mass estimation gives results that differ by 57%, and that also needn't mean that one of the methods is better than the other, but that they are telling us different things. Dr. Lacovara and team's work tells us that Dreadnoughtus has limbs whose robustness is appropriate for a 59-ton animal. You tell us that, in fact, it likely massed less than two-thirds of that. So, it was probably somewhat more athletic than we would usually expect for an animal of its size. We can deduce this from seeing where the actual mass falls relative to the regression line. But if you get your mass estimation from the regression line, then by definition you can't make such deductions. That's why I consider mass estimates from limb bone allometry less than satisfactory. Obviously, for a lot of extinct animals, they're the only estimate we're ever going to get, and it's good to have them on that basis. But when we have sufficiently complete remains, I'd always rather see a volumetric estimate. 
proportions. Dr. Matt Waddell wrote about the proportions of Dreadnoughtus as they are illustrated in the original paper. The original skeletal reconstruction shows the animal with a long torso. This is comparatively, of course. This was all due to Dr. Waddell reconfiguring the lengths of the individual vertebra by using the lengths of just the centrum of the vertebra, plus consideration of the width of cartilage between the bones. With that, Dr. Waddell found the torso should be 20% shorter. This results in a much shorter looking torso than was originally figured. Once you put the two skeletals next to each other, you begin to really understand what 20% can do to a body. The OG does look a bit wiener doggy. This shortening of the torso also results in a modification of the animal's estimated weight, which I will get to in due time. Further Nonsense About Mass Aside from Dr. Waddell and his SV Pow Pals response to the Dreadnoughtus paper, many other researchers took a crack at the hard to accept original mass estimate. Gregory S. Paul, talented paleoartist, researcher, notoriously hard to photograph, professional little guy, took the next crack at this conundrum. In his published rebuttal, he states, to correctly restore mass for a given, at least fairly complete, specimen, especially for an extinct species without close living analogs or relatives, requires a rigorous skeletal and total volume restoration based on modern techniques. Also of great utility when comparing masses between specimens and species is comparisons of volumes derived from high quality restorations constructed using consistent criteria. Unfortunately, Paul goes on to suggest one of the methods you can use to get accurate reconstructions of the bones to use as a basis for volume calculations, and thus mass. I say unfortunately, as though it definitely has its merit and can be used effectively in many contexts, it seems like it would allow a higher percentage of human error than other methods. As Paul states, Using standard tracing techniques to digitized efforts involving laser scannings of the fossil bones, the first is not necessarily less accurate than the latter because achieving correct proportions is merely a matter of paying due attention. Using laser scan results to then produce a hand tracing ensures accurate results, unless major human error intrudes. Paul then brings up a great point that Dr. Waddell brought up and is probably the biggest issue among laypeople regarding the biggest of the dinosaurs. Artistic license when it comes to the application of muscles and fat to appendages does not, as many presume, have a major impact in variable results in restoring mass for a given specimen. In sauropods, even the often very large necks make up less of the total mass than it may visually appear because they were highly pneumatic. Sauropods may look absolutely gigantic, and they were, but that gigantism doesn't have to equal masses surpassing the physical limits of animal biology. Those necks and tails were the least heavy parts of the body, as they didn't have huge heavy digestive tracts running through them, nor were they really carrying anything other than, well, themselves. The entire skeleton of the dinosaurs was invaded by hollowed spaces, hence the descriptive hollow bones. Some dinosaurs had more or less hollow bones, and most had hollower or solider bones in certain parts of their bodies. For the sauropods, their necks and tails were the hollowest, with the most invasion of hollow air sacs. This can be observed from the outside in how all of the neck bones tend to look like, well, it's hard to find a comparison. They look a little bit like all the spindly bits and suspensions we have used to make our bridges. And they kind of look a little like a tesseract if all the bits of the tesseract were hollow, so you just had bars reinforcing a central unit. I'm sure there are better descriptive comparisons to be made, but alas, I'm one feller. Gregory S. Paul suggests that the measurements were accurate and agreed with the bones that were scanned and recombobulated into a 3D model. This guy. But both the measurements and the scanned bones don't match up as well with the 2D side profile skeletal reconstruction the one Dr. Waddell fixed by shortening the ribcage a tad. Old Greg ends up with a mass estimate of 45 tons when he used the femur as a key measurement for mass. 
Then he got 29 tons when he scaled the skeletal reconstruction to the correct length of the back vertebrae. Paul made his own reconstruction of Dreadnoughtus based on his calculations and it ends up looking a lot more like other known titanosaurs. His Dreadnoughtus had a little taller of a shoulder than the OG reconstruction. Paul notes here that another error in the first reconstruction is that they arched the back vertebrae too tightly. Titanosaurs either had a gently arched back or nearly straight. Here, as well, the neck and tail are thinner, thus making their cross-sections different and aligning more with what Dr. Weddell and company were finding. A year or so later, another group of researchers took a crack at Dreadnought's size. At this point, I'm starting to think it doesn't matter too, too much. Size doesn't really matter, right guys? It's how you use it. Anyway, Drs. Carl Bates, Peter Falkingham, Sophie McCulley, Charlotte Brasse, and Susanna Maidment published their own study on changing up the size of Dreadnoughtus to match reality a bit better. They made this ugly but oh so practical digital volumetric model of Dreadnoughtus using the digitized skeleton as a base. Just for shits and giggles, or like comparisons or something, the team also made volumetric models of six living critters. Tres pajaros, dos cocodrios, y uno lagarto, plus two extinky fellers, giraffe -a titan and a patasaurus. Anyone else ever forget if it's giraffe -a titan or giraffe -a titan? Probably just a me thing. They T-posed all of the models for better comparison and divided them up into their body part segments. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Oh wait, no, it was head, neck, trunk, tail, thigh, shank, foot, humerus, forearm, and hand, like a bionicle. The figure caption here is a little hard to read, but based on what I'm seeing, it seems like the top one here is just the base model, and B is also the base model. And then C here is the base model with an added 21% extra volume. And then D is the maximal volume before it starts getting cartoony. Based on their math, this team found that the regular model came out to about 22 tons. The 21% extra was 27 tons and the big fat boy slim here was a whole 38 tons. So this test using these alternate methods came up with similar masses to Dr. Weddell and Paul's work. All of these alternate tests have been consistent and consistently lower than the original 59 ton estimate. The team's work, comparing the simple scaling equations from the first paper to a volumetric approach that made extra room for the respiratory system, found that using the scaling equation approach unintentionally resulted in the animal having an impossible amount of bulk. Too much fat, skin, muscle, and more. That's where the heft would have come from if it were accurate. After this newer 2015 study was published, Dr. Lacovera expressed skepticism of the downsize, stating, The method of measuring the skeleton and using it to estimate mass is based on the observation in living animals that, from a biomechanical standpoint, animals have the limbs they need, no more and no less. This newer study is therefore positing Dreadnoughtus as an exception to the rule. It would mean the beast had massively sturdy limbs, its frame didn't really need to hold up an assumedly smaller mass. You usually need to apply alternate mass estimation techniques to finds that are poorly preserved. Dreadnoughtus is not such a find, so the aversion to the traditional mass estimation techniques was odd to Dr. Lacovera. The Dreadnoughtus specimens have all the bones needed to estimate a mass from just a simple formula. Dr. Lacovera was not so sure that you could even estimate the volume of an animal's skin based on the number of bones they found of Dreadnoughtus. In their original paper, Dr. Lacovera and his team were pretty clear about how uncertain they were of the overall size of the skeleton. If any of these uncertain variables were tweaked, Lacovera explained, the volume would change. Some artists make dinosaurs look chubby. Some make them look like they're shrimp crabs. Volume just isn't preserved in the fossil records, and that's what they're using. Historically, scientists have worked with the data that exists, which is a pretty good policy. If I was making a new method, I'd apply it to as many skeletons and more complete ones than ours as possible. He said, Ours just isn't a great candidate for this. I imagine if you did this to all dinosaurs, estimated with traditional methods, they'd all change proportionally. But this just makes Tritonauts shrink. 
I'm not exactly sure how Genosis got involved. In 2019, Gregory S. Paul published a study regarding the question of what the largest known land animal is and how to determine it. In this paper, he changed his previous Dreadnoughtus mass estimate to 31 tons, so a bit heavier than before. Paul states, Entirely analog, skillfully produced, high anatomical fidelity skeletal restorations and volumetric models representing a prime lean condition are approximately as scientifically objective and accurate, as well as more realistic than, analog digital crudely formed convex hull volumetric models, which are based on subjectively and often inconsistently or erroneously mounted skeletons and digitized skeletal reconstructions. I don't know about that one way or the other, as I have no direct experience in these techniques, but there is clearly a continual back and forth on what is more or less objective, accurate, or precise. There will definitely be more techniques as time progresses. <laughs> Size matters not. Let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get a better idea of how large this titan was. Dreadnoughtus has been estimated to have been about 85 feet or 26 meters in length. This doesn't make it the longest dinosaur known to science, but definitely still puts it in the exclusive club of largest dinosaurs. According to the original paper, it may have weighed in as much as 59 tons, thus making it 8.5 times that of a large male African elephant, and even exceeding the Boeing 737-900 airliner. Now, with the long history of changing Dreadnoughtus mass, I should note that it remains a possibility this beast could have been much lighter, or heavier on average. Dr. Waddell estimated 30 to 40 tons, while Paul estimated 26 to 74 tons. Bates team found a range between 22 and 38 tons, while Paul again re-estimated it at 31 tons. Another study in 2020 found a mass of 49 tons too. Either way, it was a hefty chunker. Thanks, Mr. Man. Big Rubber Dummy Baby Bumper Boy the smaller of the two Dreadnoughtus specimens would of course be a younger individual. There may have been some form of sexual dimorphism here, but there is so little preserved of the smaller specimen, you would not be able to determine its sex without finding medullary bone in its skeleton. Even then, you would not fully be able to determine which characteristics in its skeleton were dimorphic or even ontogenetic. The larger specimen must be older, right? Well, probably, but it was far from elderly. The paper that described the remains did histology on the bones. Histology is the study of microscopic tissues. When it comes to dino bones, to look at the histology of the bones, you have to cut a super thin slice through a bone. This thin slice needs to be a certain thickness so that it can be glued to a glass slide, so that light can shine through it, and so you can slide it underneath the microscope to see what's going on. If enough outlines and details of the original bone are preserved, then you may be able to observe information about the animal left behind. In the case of the larger specimen of Dreadnoughtus, the histologic samples of its bones show that it was still growing. It had yet to reach full skeletal maturity. This means that the mass estimates were being attributed to an animal that likely still got bigger than most of those estimates. Oh well, it happens. Wrist bone connected to the What comes with one of the most complete titanosaurian sauropod specimens yet found is a cornucopia of research opportunities. One of the many that slowly oozed from the broken remains of the two titans was how they moved. Students from Drexel University moved to figure out how the giant dinosaurs moved their fat, round bodies. Figuring out precisely the method under which a dinosaur moved and proving it with math, digital models, or physical experiments is fascinating and just batshit cool no matter the circumstances. But it is especially awesome-tacular when it comes to the largest dinosaurs and land animals to ever live. The first step to figuring out how these behemoths strode across the land besides finding the specimens in the first place is to scan dem bones, dem bones. 
Image scanning can be done with a few different methods and can take shorter or longer, depending on the amount and types of bones you have. Dr. Lacovera and his team used a Next Engine Model 2020i desktop 3D laser scanner and 100 volunteers to scan all 145 Dreadnoughtus bones. It took them 600 hours total. After this, then grad student Christine Volga produced three dimensional digital models of all scanned bones using Next Engine Scan Studio HD Pro software and articulated these models in likely anatomical positions using Autodesk Maya 3D animation software. They then used Geomagic Studio software to export all components of the digital skeleton as a series of 10 three-dimensional Adobe PDF files, which were made publicly and freely available for all to use. Thankfully for me, that model was then uploaded for free to Sketchfab. See? Look at it, isn't it cool? I highly recommend playing around with this thing. I wish I could 3D print every single bone at life size. Once the bones were cleaned up and articulated, the dynamic simulation program MSC Atoms was used to attach virtual muscles and ligaments to the bones, where the muscle scars could be seen. Our reconstruction of the joint is based partly on the morphology of the bone. The shape and well-preserved muscle attachment scars give us a good idea about where tendons and muscles might have been attached, Vogel said. We also look at the joints of reference species like chickens and crocodiles, which are the closest living relatives and are predicted to share many physiological characteristics with dinosaurs. Another reason to make a model like this of a dinosaur forelimb is to figure out the shape and extent of cartilage, as that tends to not fossilize very often. To turn this digital model physical, they contacted a professor at the College of Engineering. The team had undergraduate researcher David McDevitt use a MakerBot 3D printer to print out a 6-inch 1 10th scale Dreadnoughtus forearm, taking about 12 hours. We started with the forelimb because the fossilized bones were the best preserved and have some of the most distinct features that indicate muscle and tendon attachment, Vogel said. The digital models indicate that Dreadnoughtus had cartilage that was relatively structurally similar to the cartilage of the living species they used as reference, probably something like elephants or giraffes. The cartilage was also made for the 3D printed model by first 3D printing molds and then casting the cartilage in silicone. According to the Drexel University news blog, In order to attach the simulated ligaments, McDevitt added six tiny nubs to the bone schematic before printing. Positioned where Vogel's digital model suggests the dinosaur's ligaments were likely attached, these nubs act as hooks for the limb model's three rubber band-like ligaments. To add the muscle power that will direct the movement of the limb, McDevitt created a biomechanical rig that looks like a sophisticated lab bench-sized set of monkey bars. But for this project, the object dangling from them is a miniature dinosaur limb. This rig has three motor banks simulating movement of three opposing muscle groups. It does this by spooling and unspooling Teflon-coated steel cables threaded over frictionless rollers that are attached to the bones. A complex rig. Using Vogel's schematics, McDevitt attached these cables where the muscles and ligaments are hypothesized to attach. This results in this mathematical monstrosity. With but a few mashes of buttons and keys, the mechanical monster can be set in motion. As of the time of the article on this experiment, it could only bend up and down. As the limb flexes, cameras caught the movement for comparison to both the digital model and future recordings after different adjustments are made to the rig. This is basically a plug-and-play model. McDevitt said, We can print out any of the bone scans or cartilage designs that Kristen sends over, and it's easy enough to attach the simulated muscles and ligaments at different positions on the bones. Part of the positives for making a real physical model is that you don't have to function gravity into it as it is already working on the model. 
These two forces were the big factors at play when dinosaurs moved. We suspect that energy efficiency and conservation had a lot to do with their behavior and movement, so being able to study movement from a biomechanical standpoint gives us a great perspective on how these creatures might have moved. In order to figure out what kind of long-necked dinosaur these carcasses were, the research team had to list all of the characteristics of the bones and put them in a digital matrix of other characters from other sauropod dinosaurs. This would allow the creation of a few possibilities and required figuring out which of those is the most likely. Dreadnoughtus was put in a matrix that included 70 other sauropods and 341 characteristics. They found that Dreadnoughtus was definitely a Titanosaurian sauropod belonging to Titanosauria. Dreadnoughtus contains a suite of characteristics seen in both basal, or early diverging, members of the Titanosauria, as well as derived or advanced Titanosaurs. The analyses found that Dreadnoughtus was somewhere right outside the Lithostrotian bin. The Lithostrotia is a group that contained a bunch of the later titanosaurs, a group so big it contained some of the smaller sauropods as well as some of the largest to ever live. Patagotitan was a Lithostrotian, so was the armored Saltosaurus, and the titanic Alamosaurus who muscled their way through possible attacks from Tyrannosaurus. The Lithostrotia were named after the presence of osteoderms, or bony armor that grew within the skin, though many unarmored forms are now known, and this is not a distinguishing feature. An important feature that separates the group is the vertebrae, specifically of the tail. All vertebrae of the tail, except for the very last few, have a condition called procelus. Procelus means the front face of the bone was concave, with the back convex. The second most important feature is that the neck vertebrae near the base of the connection between the neck and torso were strongly procelus as well. The original team figured out where Dreadnoughtus fit in the Titanosaurian tree, but they made sure to be clear that its combination of primitive and advanced features combined with the instability of Titanosaurian interrelationships meant that Dreadnoughtus may need adjusting as time progresses. A 2016 analysis of Dreadnoughtus limb bones noted how the animal contained a lot of characteristics of the Lithostrotians, suggesting it may be more closely related to this group than originally estimated, but they made no new hypotheses or analyses on what that would actually look like and no newer analyses have been done. Reading the Rocks the only known remains of Dreadnoughtus come from the Cerro Fortaleza Formation. If you want to know more than just superficial information, the stats on these animals, you have to understand the rocks and the biology. Quick digression, this is why getting a paleontological education is much more of a choose-your-own-adventure than other fields. You can go down a biology route, a geology route, or perhaps even an engineering, oil and gas, evolutionary biology, anthropology slash archaeology slash paleoarchaeology route, depending on your interests. That being said, you still need to understand the fundamentals, which includes basic biology and basic geology. In regard to the study of the fossils of dinosaurs, knowing and understanding the rocks and what they mean is essential, not just for understanding the animals you study, but the world they lived in and how it may have changed. So, snapping back to reality and ooping for the gravity, the bulk of the Cerro Fortaleza formation is composed of three fluvial facies. In geology, a facies is a body of rock with specified characteristics. It includes the chemical, physical, and biological features that distinguish a chunk of rock from many adjacent rocks. Fluvial just means rivers, so these rocks are derived from river sediments. The three fluvial facies are channel fill, crevasse splay, and floodplain. Channel fill are accumulations of sand and detritus in a stream channel where the transport and capacity of the water is insufficient to remove the material as rapidly as it is delivered, a channel that gets filled and then lithifies. 
Crevasse splay is a sedimentary fluvial deposit which forms when a stream breaks its natural or artificial levees and deposits sediment on a floodplain. A floodplain deposit is any amount of sediment that gets deposited in a floodplain, which is a generally flat area of land next to a river or stream. For the Cerro Fortaleza formation, all three facies types show different kinds of rocks, coarse to medium-grained sandstones, very fine sandstones, to even mudstones, carbon-stuffed root fossils, and petrified wood, combined with the sediment types found in the rocks, scream to anyone who knows how to read the rocks that the region was a poorly drained, sopping mess of a low-lying forested floodplain. The skeletons of sauropods are hard to be preserved in any form of completion. First off, big animals are easily torn apart by predators and scavengers before they even get a chance to decay and get buried. That first step often results in disarticulation of all of the body parts, leaving nothing behind to be buried. Sometimes there may be singular bones that get left behind in the same place the animal died, but no guarantees. Smaller animals tend to be preserved more intact because they are small, their bones are small, and big scavengers don't see them as easily to get to them. If you are a scavenger and you find a whole tiny dead body, you're going to swallow it whole. But that's if you find it to begin with. A big body requires you to butcher it just so you can eat your own portion of it. Okay, cool, next. The bigger the dinosaur, the airier they are. The bones of sauropods are very airy. Despite this, they are very strong. This is due to added struts crisscrossing the void spaces. Despite despite that, the voids still mean the bones decay faster and easier than bones that have little to no voids in them. They can break from mechanical forces easier. Nasty stuff gets inside the voids to decay the bones easier, plus other stuff. Lastly, sauropods are big. Even the small ones were big. However, when it comes to the biggest of the big, sort of like Dretnotus, it would take a lot of environmental serendipity to cover the body. In order to preserve such large specimens as Dretnotus, you would need the environment to work quickly. It has to cover the freshly dead bodies faster than other environmental actions can rip the body apart and scatter it to the winds. What about these big ass bodies? You would need a freak environmental event to provide you with enough space and enough material to cover all of the body so that it can be sealed away from the decay beasts. The kind of freak environmental event big enough and fast enough to cover Dreadnoughtus would have to be a flood. So this is the most likely process that sealed the beasts away. A slow but continual burial would leave some of the body exposed to the elements, resulting in, like, half of the body being decayed, while the other half gets sealed in sediment. The preservation of the left-hand side of the larger individual suggests the body may have come to rest on its left side after death, or during the flood that buried it. The right-hand bits were either torn off before burial, or eroded away millions of years after it became fossilized and before it was discovered, who knows? The smaller specimen was found eroding out of the edge of the rock that housed the bigger specimen, which would strongly suggest its missing bits were taken by the environment after it had become a fossil. The shed crowns of theropod toofers were found with the dreadnoughtus remains, as well as probable tooth marks on a tail vertebra of the smaller long neck. The descriptors thought this may have been inflicted on the remains after death as a form of scavenging. Those teeth were speculated to have belonged to the Megaraptor and Orcoraptor, as it has been found in this formation. Orcoraptor's bones share some superficial similarities to the Dromaeosaurs and Compsognathids, hence the name, but eventually the animal was found to be a Megaraptor, a group of burly-armed, butcher-handed theropods with pointy skulls. The few remains of this animal suggest a medium-sized predator of 6 to 8 meters, making it not exactly much of a threat to the largest Dreadnoughtus. Dreadnoughtus would have been chowing down on all sorts of tall plants. With its peg-like teeth, it stripped the needles from conifer trees and leaves from ferns and swallowed them whole. Who would want to waste time chewing when you have a fermentation tank for a stomach? 
The paleobotany of this formation and region remains largely unpublished and in its infancy, so there isn't a ton of work to go on. But what has been said suggests there were lots of gymnosperm plants, ferns, and angiosperm plants. Angiosperms and ferns were more prevalent than gymnosperms, though there is a site called the Maria Elena Petrified Forest indicating a large amount of petrified wood. This should tell us the plant life at this time and place wasn't too far off from the plant life of other times. Monkey puzzle trees, small flowering plants, ferns covering most of the ground, and conifer trees being the major forms of plants. Perhaps Dreadnoughtus acted as a seed dispersal for some of these plants, being able to digest the fruiting bodies, but not the seeds of these plants. The animal would poop out the seeds and grow new plants. The humid climate of the Cerro Fortaleza formation allowed many other animals to thrive. Fossils of mollusks, bivalves, gastropods, ostracods, and marine microplankton have been found. They would have made up the base of the ecosystem, along with the algae, plants, and insects, of course. Without them, nothing is possible. Their presence also denotes the climate. Softy gastropods like it wet. They were joined and snacked on by fish. Longfish, ray-finned normies, and sharks. Turtle bones have also been found in these rocks so it is not much of a jump to think modern crocodilians were here too. Other forms of crocodilomorphs were here too, probably of the terrestrial variety. I'm sure they enjoyed the intervals of high rainfall and high water tables that the rainy season brought. The Iguanodont Talancon was found in this formation as well. It is relatively similar to the Jurassic Dryosaurus and early Cretaceous Tenontosaurus in build known from relatively complete remains and reached about 4 meters, 13 feet in length. It would have snipped at smaller trees, large bushes, cycads, ferns, and maybe even crustaceans, rotting wood, and gastropods when it felt snackish. A possible noasaur, a laphrosaur-esque neoceratosaurian was here too, Ostrochirus. It is known only from very fragmentary material, so its appearance is much more of a guess. Abelosauroid material has also been found in this formation, but has yet to be described. I would not be surprised if Carcharodontosaurs were here too, since they were in South America for a long time before kicking the bucket right before the meteor struck. Lastly, but not leastly, was a Titanosaurian sauropod even larger than Dreadnoughtus, Puertosaurus. Puertosaurus is extremely fragmentary. It is known only from a neck bone, a backbone, and two tail bones. Though just bits, those bits were absolutely massive and dwarfed equivalent bones and Dreadnoughtus. Dreadnoughtus was just one part of something bigger, a huge ecosystem full of other life forms, fighting, loving, playing, eating, dying, not in harmony, but still connected. What would come next for the Titan could only have been imagined by those who found it. Fossils come in all shapes, sizes, preservations, colors, and more. Some of the rarest among the fossil types, aside from gem-quality specimens, are those which preserved impressions or replaced soft tissues. Dino mummies are the best example here, but there are also plenty of other animals found with their soft tissues preserved. However, these fossils preserve little to no percentage of the original organic material that was once in those soft tissues. There exists a secret type of fossil that also preserves soft tissues, but not in the same way as the more well-known type. These fossils often do not preserve impressions or replacements of soft tissues, but do preserve bits of the original organic tissues. Most of the time, these tissues are preserved within super hard bones, like leg bones. Sometimes this is not the case, but that is rare. As such, the idea of exceptional preservation has evolved over the last several decades to encompass fossils that maintain part of their original organic composition, as well as specimens that retain delicate morphological characteristics through processes such as phosphatization. There are now plenty of techniques fossil workers use to analyze fossils to see if they contain these itty-bitty fragments of organics 
like amino acid analyses, Raman spectroscopy, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, immunology, time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry, and tandem mass spectrometry. But of course, the techniques are not limited to this list. Despite the impending rise of the body of evidence for original internal organic material surviving millions of years, these findings have been met with skepticism, most of the time well-placed skepticism. Most of that skepticism seems to come from the thought that we do not yet fully understand the geochemical mechanisms which might allow for such preservation. In other words, some researchers caution skepticism towards these tissues as they may not represent entirely what they seem to. They may not be literally the exact same organic material that used to be in the given structure, though there are some proposed hypotheses that seem to suggest that there truly are some geochemical factors that may positively influence preservation like iron involvement, microbial activity, and or condensation reactions. These studies often only look at specific cases in isolation rather than whole skeletons, animals, ecosystems, and such. This makes it a tad difficult to infer larger scale relationships between the geochemical environment and preservation. As a result, most paleomolecular studies lack extensive depositional and geochemical data that may contribute to developing credible, multifaceted theories concerning molecular preservation in deep time. In other words, it's complicated, guys. Plenty of the studies and fossils are promising, and plenty likely do represent some form of soft tissue, but plenty researchers just want to be cautious about overreaching until tech advances, new techniques are devised, more interdisciplinary research is done, more specimens are found, and things can be more solidly proven one way or another. Which brings us to old Dreadnoughtus, the living dreadnought of Argentina. Two specimens of Dreadnoughtus are known, one big, one small. The larger of the two, the holotype, and the most complete, is given the designation MPM PV1156. This specimen allows for detailed examination of the way in which it was preserved, the way its body was buried, how the bones decomposed before that, and how it changed from bone to inorganic minerals. The original descriptors, Dr. Kenneth Lacavera, and a list of 16 other researchers hypothesized that the body of the big boy was entombed during a quick burial event, like that of a crevasse splay. This hypothesis was based on the extraordinary completeness of the skeleton and evidence of deformation of the rock and sediment layers it was buried in at the time it was buried. Rapid burial tends to be an important first step for pretty much every single fossil specimen that preserves any kind of soft tissue. Considering how well preserved the remains of this dinosaur were at the macroscopic level, the new team, including the likes of Dr. Elena Schroeter, Dr. Paul V. Ullman, Kyle McCulley, Dr. Richard Ash, Wenxia Zhang, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, and Dr. Kenneth Lacovera have hypothesized that the initial swift burial event that protected the skeleton may have protected some of the internal microscopic structures as well potentially even original proteins. In the new study, the team gave a few things a thorough once over. The geologic background of the sauropod skeleton, like the rock layers and sediments that make those layers, as well as the way in which each part of the dinosaur's body was messed with after death, how each part was deposited, how each part was buried, and turned into minerals. After that, the team took it into the micro scale. They examined the animal's left humerus under the microscope to see how it was preserved and buried on the inside. The steps the team took to do all of this includes histological analysis and x-ray diffraction to assess the structural integrity of the bone microstructure and the extent of its internal mineral content. Laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry to assess its geochemical history based on the spatial heterogeneity of rare earth elements and other pertinent trace elements throughout the bone cortex. 
chemical demineralization and optical microscopy of bone tissue to assess the morphological preservation of soft tissue microstructures and in situ and in solution immunological assays to assess the presence of internal proteins. With all those annoyingly academic words out of the way, now we must briefly explore the stratigraphy, geology, and taphonomy of the specimen. I may have touched on some of this at some point, so I will do my best to summarize. Both specimens of Dreadnoughtus were recovered from outcrops of the late Cretaceous Cerro Fortaleza formation along the east bank of the Rio La Leona in Santa Cruz Province, Argentina, back in 2005 till 2008. Based on the earlier recovery of Campanian-aged ammonites from the underlying La Anita formation and Maastrichtian pollen grains and spores from the overlying La Irina formation, Dr. Kenneth Lacovera and friends estimated its age to be Campanian to Maastrichtian. Recent radiometric dating of Cerro Fortaleza formation, detrital zircons, and the Dreadnoughtus quarry limits the date of these deposits to the Campanian, so about 83.6 to 72.1 million years ago. The layers of the Cerro Fortaleza formation are made up of fluvial, or river, and overbank rocks. These rocks were deposited in the Austral Basin, which happens to now be east of the southern Patagonian Andes. The long neck remains were uncovered from rocks that were made of tan, finely trough cross bedded, fine to medium grained sandstone, and gray homogeneous mudstone containing abundant plant remains. That first rock type looks like this, while the gray stuff looks a little bit like this. These rocks are represented as crevasse splay, which was spluged out onto a river-fed floodplain. The waves in the rocks tell you that there was some water movement of the sediment, which may have been the power needed to bury the whole dino skeletons. Now, we move into the sample collection portion of this project. The team took fragments of the bone from the center of the humerus. They also took samples of the sediment around the bones immediately after they took the plaster jackets off. They were placed in a glass container and dried and left until this new team got the time to study it. Then they took another bone fragment from the mid shaft of a long bone for a rare earth element analysis. The bone would go on to be sectioned into slices and embedded in resin. The team made sure to gather some control samples too. In this case, they used sections of bones from a chicken and an American alligator. Histology Histology, as I have gone over many times on this channel, is the study of microscopic tissues. I really need to get to a video going through this fascinating field and technique. Anyways, the practice can look at any and all tissues, skin, airways, organ surfaces, reproductive and digestive tracts, tendons, bone, blood, ligament, fat, areolar, muscles, organs, and all that kind of good squishy stuff. Most of the techniques here were invented based on living tissues, but can and have recently and increasingly been used to analyze the tissues of extinct fossil organisms. So, for Dreadnoughtus, the team took their bone fragments and embedded it in resin. Then they took a wafer saw and sliced up some delicious 2mm thick sections. Next, the team took those sections and mounted them to a glass slide with epoxy and ground and polished the thin section's fossil side to transparency. Finally, the sections were imaged with a transmitted light microscope that was fitted with circularly polarized light filters and a motorized XYZ stage. It was also set up to take automated image montages of the sections. X-ray diffraction Next up was X-ray stuff. The team took some of the bone fragments and powdered them in tungsten carbide mixer mill, which I assume means they ground the specimen into powder to a scale of about 10 microns. Then they took the powder into an expert diffractometer and then diffracted some x-rays into the powder to get an idea of the kinds of elements or rare earth elements present in the bones. Then they used laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry to shoot lasers and get back information on elements and such. Demineralization 
The team then took bits from the dinosaur humerus and incubated them in a chemical mixture called disodium ethylene diamine ethylene diamine tetra acetic acid Blech. too many vowels it does go by eta for short they left the bone in the mixture for two weeks anything that remained after that bath was moved to a glass slide and doused in acetone to remove any glues and stuff after that, the whole thing was imaged in transmitted light and cross-polarized light under the microscope. Immunofluorescence Another assay thrown at the bony bits was immunofluorescence. The team took demineralized tissues from the dinosaur, the chicken, and the alligator and embedded them in resin, sectioned them out into 220 micron slides, and then subjected them to immunofluorescence assays. This technique is complex and is different according to what is being studied, but here they used polyclonal rabbit anti-chicken collagen-1 antibodies to get antigens and fluorescent dyes to light up. It helps to show where certain tissues are and whether they are present. Enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay When I said this study was dense, I meant it. The next thing the teeth did was enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA tests. They took bone and sediment fragments, removed any mineral contents with hydrochloric acid, solubilized any proteins present with another chemical called guanidine hydrochloride. Then, of course, included some control samples with the mixture, but no material. They extracted any proteins that were present. Results Now, we get to take a look at what the team found by going through all these tests. First up is the histology. Here's an image of one of those slices on a slide. The team wrote that the bone shows primary fibrolamellar bone at the periosteal surface transitioning to densely remodeled secondary bone deeper at the medullary cavity. This is the kind of bone found in fast-growing, high-metabolism animals as well as large dinosaurs. This matches the identification of this dinosaur as not fully grown. The team did not find any evidence of tunneling through the bone by fungus. This means the bone did not undergo much of any microbial decay. The X-ray diffraction analysis was done on the bones to see if the original minerals were replaced over time after fossilization. Their results found four major minerals, dolomite and three types of apatite. They technically found that the bone was about 5% calcite dolomite and 95% apatite. This reflects a very minimal replacement of the OG skeletal material by outside minerals. They found the rare earth elements captured in the bone were mostly just manganese and strontium, with minor concentrations of yttrium, scandium, uranium, and iron. They found that the rare earth elements were most concentrated on the outside of the bone and sharply decreased further towards the center. No shock there. Soft Tissues So what did the team find out about the soft tissues preserved in the bones after all those experiments had been conducted? They found that the demineralized bone from the center of the leg bone contained what appeared to be soft, flexible structures similar in shape to vasculature, the fibrous, collagenous matrix of bone, and osteocytes. Vessels were discovered developing immediately from the fossil tissue as well as in solution after demineralization and EDTA acid. Isolated samples of these hollow, flexible tubes did not disintegrate after several acetone treatments, ruling out the possibility that they are cast created by the infilling of acetone-soluble glues and or field consolidates. The tapering bifurcation pattern seen in living animal arteries and reported soft tissues from other ancient vertebrates was also seen in recovered vessels of Dreadnoughtus. The vessels seen in the dinosaur's bones can be ruled out as the hyphae of fungus as they are completely different in form. Hyphae are an order of magnitude smaller in size than the structures observed in the dino bone. Regardless of stage orientation, vasculature showed minimal birefringence when scanned with cross-polarized light. 
The only birefringent seen was in small, isolated spots along the vessel wall, leaving the remainder of the structure black. Birefringence just being the way a mineral will reflect light and shine back to different colors of light depending on the angle you are looking at it and the angle at which it is under the microscope. Because most minerals are anisotropic and exhibit birefringence under cross-polarized light, the lack of birefringence in these structures, as well as their pliability, are characteristics more compatible with an organic, amorphous substance than a mineralized cast. In other words, these things are the real deal, not a mineral replacement. The matrix retrieved from the dreadnought's bones was soft, flexible, and fibrous, with encapsulated, elongated osteocytes arranged parallel to one another. Osteocytes are simply bone-producing cells, for those wondering. In general, these osteocytes have shorter, blunted, philopodia-like features as compared to probable osteocytes from other extinct animals. It is unknown if this is due to tissue degeneration between the fossil's exhumation and analysis, or if it is an artifact of preservation produced by the unique depositional environment in which the specimen was entombed. Regardless, the team was able to recover specimens of these elongated structures with the characteristic philopodia-like extensions of extant osteocytes. Isolated osteocytes, like vasculature, did not disintegrate in acetone and showed very little birefringence when viewed under cross-polarized light, ruling out their origin as glue or mineral infill of osteocytes. Immunofluorescence Results so, a lot of this has to do with biology, chemistry, and medicine-esque terminology, so I don't entirely understand the ins and outs of it. I don't think we totally need to in order to get an understanding of what the team did and what they found. They found that the thin sections of chicken and gator bones fluoresced as they should. They used chicken antibodies and dyes to get parts of the bone to fluoresce, so it makes sense both would light up. They are relatives. The chicken bones lit up stronger than the gator bones, which is expected. Since sauropods are related to both crocs and birds and are bracketed by them in an evolutionary context, its bones should work with the antibodies the team used. Turns out that was correct, and the dreadnoughtus bones lit up. Though in the dinosaur, the bones fluoresced the most dimly among all samples. To make sure this fluorescence wasn't because of a list of other possible factors, the team did some other tests and controls and found that it could be ruled out that the collagens they were seeing were because of other factors. In other words, they showed again and again that what they were getting was really organic stuff from the dino's bones. So, for all intents and purposes, the dreadnoughtus humerus seems to preserve original what is called early diagenetic signatures, which have not been meaningfully destroyed by later diagenetic processes. Diagenesis being the process by which sediment becomes rock or bone becomes fossil. The immunological tests and immunofluorescent assays all show that it really is collagen that has been preserved within the bone. A surprising element to the dreadnoughtus tissues is that the bones of dreadnoughtus are more fossilized, you know, your average fossilization seen in most dinosaur fossils, and yet you still find preserved collagen. Most other fossils in which collagen has been found are those that have undergone very little alteration after burial. The other thing the team found that other paleomolecular researchers should think about moving forward is to include more extensive geochemical analyses as part of the routine molecular testing methods. Only more data and more deep comprehensive data will allow for a better and more complex understanding of how sediment and bone become mineral and rock. And no, the soft tissues did not preserve DNA. And no, we cannot resurrect a real, genuine, non-avian dinosaur, so don't ask. The Silver Screen Screams When the Dreadnoughtus paper was first published, there was a huge media push for the beast. The only reason I can think of is that it was one of the most complete of its kind. Any new sauropod known from fossils more substantive than five vertebrae is worthy of celebration. The hype is what led it to becoming embroiled in the back and forth over its size in the year or so that followed its publication. 
After this, the hype quickly died. Its name, however, would live on, as it is too edgy and badass for some to resist. Dreadnoughtus would next show up in the Jurassic Park franchise. It first appears in the short film called The Prologue, for the sixth, final, and ultimately disappointing Jurassic World Dominion. Said prologue never actually made the cut for the final theatrical run of the film and was instead used to promote it a year or so before its release. The Dreadnoughtus would then appear again in the full film a few times. The Dreadnoughtus in the newest Jurassic schlock is not at all that bad, actually. It is still a bit cartoonized in some parts of its anatomy, namely its musculature and head. The head is a weird shape for these type of titanosaurs. Obviously, no skull was found with the remains, but the head shape of the movie monster really doesn't match most sauropods that do have a more complete skull and are also somewhat closely related to the dread. Both times the animal shows up in Jurassic World Dominion, its details are obscured. You can see them much better in the 3D model made by Ludia for their many Jurassic World mobile games and in the toy by Mattel. But obviously, these are going to be taking a lot more liberties, so I won't count it. Suffice it to say, all of them are far worse off than the design shown in the film. Hey, Kenneth Lackelbauer here. I have a new toy. Literally, a new toy. I'm a grown man. And I have toys. This was sent to me by the nice people at NBC Universal Studios. And it happens to contain a model of a dinosaur that I discovered called Dreadnoughtus. must say though that it is extremely annoying to see a sauropod put in a swamp again. I do recognize that sauropods could and would submerge themselves in water like every other animal on the planet, but it's just a weird trope that seems to happen only in these movies. The musculature is really weird for the dino. The arms are extremely hyper-muscled, or at least the skin is so thin in those areas that you see almost every fiber of those muscles bulging like a roided out dude at the gym. I won't make much of a comment on how realistic this is as that varies between animal groups and the conditions imposed on individuals. Modern herbivores tend to be squishier and less hypermuscular than carnivores, but there are many exceptions here. At least it has better colors and patterns than the hideous Apatosaurus of Jurassic World or the classic brachio Titan of Jurassic Park. The animal also appeared before the film in the Jurassic World Evolution and Evolution 2. Here the proportions and angle of the body are much more in line with what is known of titanosaurs, but its front feet are disturbingly elephantine or rhinocerine in appearance, with individual hoofed nails. It also has the most capybara looking face I have ever seen applied to a sauropod, which is definitely worse than the weird muppety looking thing in the films. Finally, the critter appears in the critically acclaimed prehistoric planet in episode 2, Deserts. In this episode, the animal is represented as a lecking and or harem species. A herd of dreadnoughtus migrate to a salt flat. The females congregate in groups to watch males display to one another and to them. The dreadnoughtus here are decked out in lots of muscle and fat. They are healthy animals. The weirdest and coolest thing here is the mating display, which consists of inflatable sacks along the neck, as well as a brutish wrestling match. Bronto Smash a lot of the soft tissues in this show are influenced by the fossil record as well as inferences from modern animals. But there is of course some speculation thrown in as well. A lot more speculation is used when it comes to reconstructing behaviors, but none of these behaviors are purely made up. All of them are seen in many different groups of modern animals. These behaviors are seen across many different groups that vary in metabolisms, intelligence, and evolution. So showing them here in some extinct forms of animals is not implausible, nor impossible. The lecking thing is unknown in just about any extinct animal. It is behavior. How could it fossilize? 
The makers wanted to show how lecking might work in sauropods, and since the sauropod dinosaurs lasted from the late Triassic to the very end of the Cretaceous period, I don't see why it would be implausible that at least one species developed such a behavior. Their inflatable neck balls are another itty bit of speculation. The sauropod dinosaurs had a labyrinthine system of air sacs throughout their bodies. They were attached to the lungs and invaded the spinal column all the way to the tip of the tail and base of the skull. Here, the researchers on board the series have implied that perhaps these air sacs connected to gular sacs of the throat in a similar fashion to the living greater sage grouse, and voila, inflatable air sacs. Some nitpickers have pointed out that it would be weird for the sacs to inflate first from the head down to the base of the neck as gular display structures in living species inflate upon exhalation. So they should inflate from the lungs up, not the head down. Ech. Some have also remarked upon the facial expressions of the beasts as they tussle, but I don't really see it as anything other than their mouths slightly opening and closing as they breathe. Dreadnoughtus is reconstructed with a thumb claw on the hand. The thing is that the hand bones are largely fragmentary in both Dreadnoughtus specimens. They lack the parts of the hand where the thumb would be. In general, most titanosaurs lost their thumb claw and thumb. However, Diamantinosaurus, a titanosaur from Australia, was found with a thumb and thumb claw. A few other thumb claws are known or suspected from fragmentary or otherwise controversial late Jurassic and early Cretaceous forms. So the presence of it here in prehistoric planet Dreadnoughtus is entirely possible, but more on the speculative side. Could they rear? Yep. Only a little bit of research has been done on how likely it was for massive sauropods to rear up on their hind limbs. It was proposed all the way back in the early 1900s by racist eugenicist Henry Fairfield Osborne, stay mad chuds, where the sauropod would use its tail as a prop or third leg. The conjecture was even used as a basis for the Barosaurus skeletal mount at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. A 2005 paper hypothesized that you would find stress fractures in the forelimbs if sauropods were rearing up on their hind limbs, but none were found. A 2009 study by Heinrich Malison found that diplodocid sauropods, uropatosaurs, dicreosaurs, and diplodocids were the most adapted to rearing of all the sauropods, and even better adapted for it than elephants. They have their center of gravity right over their hips, had the most mobile necks, a well-muscled pelvis, and tail, and tail vertebrae shaped to bear the brunt of heavy loads. The same study found that titanosaurs were not so well adapted, and brachiosaurs were likely entirely incapable due to a wonky center of gravity. That seems to rule out Dreadnoughtus as a rearer, but we're not done. Dr. Darren Nash has pointed out that it should be possible, due to their wide hips, agility, strong leg muscles, and muscular tails. Considering the fighting males only rear for a very short time, I find it to be pretty plausible and possible. Plenty of animals alive today do things they aren't specifically adapted for, and sometimes stuff that even causes pain, and yet they still do it, live from it, and continue to do it without evolutionary consequences. I personally find it odd that the one that fell over and lost seemed to have just died. If they can rear, bite, and batter each other, I don't see why lightly flopping over in defeat would be enough to crush the ribcage and die. Hopefully, that satisfies your skepticism. That's about all that can be squeezed out of Dreadnoughtus, and I'm pooped. Hope you liked the video and hope you come back for Dreadnoughtus when I review the Desert's episode of Prehistoric Planet. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda, Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman, 